All right. Uh, it is time for power players, and we've got quite the power player with us <laughs> this morning. Not only is Powell speaking, we have Jared Tendler here. Uh, Jared is an author, a uh, scratch golfer, and a hell of a nice guy. If you've never seen Jared, I'm glad that you're here to see him today. He's got two books about gambling, the mental game of gambling and a mental game of gambling too. But this is the one we're really focusing on today, <laughs> the mental game of trading. Jared, how are you doing today? Really happy to have you with us. I'm doing great, John. How could how could I not be doing well after an introduction like that? <laughs> okay, that's right. That's well. Uh, you know, I, we I you know believe that uh, your book is a very important book for anybody that's trading. There's actionable actionable items to help you work through the barriers that every trader has. If you're you know wh whether you're new or old, we're still always working through those barriers, and it's a really really great book. Now. I'm going to bow out. Jared has got a bunch of the questions that you guys submitted for him. We're going to collect some of the questions that are coming through in the chat as well. You guys have heard enough from me. You want to hear from Jared. So, Jared, take it away. Thanks, John. Well, there are there may be a couple of questions we may call you in on because, you know, I'm not the purveyor of all things trading related, right? I mean, I, when we talk about the mental and emotional side of trading, you got to make sure that you have a good strategy and system in place, because if you don't, it becomes very difficult to kind of know where the mental game begins and where your trading strategy ends and begins also, right? There's a, a bit more chaos involved. And I think there might be some questions where uh, people could certainly benefit from your perspective. Um, so let's get to the questions. Um, first one is, uh, I've been profitable for three months and consistency uh, and consistently, we assume. Uh, but this month, I feel the old habits coming back. What can I do to not go back? So I kind of view this in the category of New Year's resolutions, right? And many of you may have tried this before. Say you're going to lose weight. Say you're going to work out. Whatever it may be, three or four months in, what happens, right? You start to revert back, if you even got that far, to your old habits. And why is that? Because motivation, inspiration can only carry you so far. You generate a lot of momentum, you know, early on, but then, you know, we invariably will fall back to the level of our training, right? We aspire <laughs> to more, but if you aren't using that energy to correct the core weaknesses that led to, you know, obviously some of the trading mistakes that you had before, or in the case of New Year's resolutions, why were you not working out? Why were you eating poorly? Those weaknesses uh, need to be understood, not just corrected, right? If, if you have a complicated problem, especially with some of the mental game issues that, you know, plague many of you, right? The FOMO, the greed, the anger, or as I like to call it, tilt, the revenge trading, overconfidence, which I'll talk about. There's some questions here related to that. So there's a, a variety of mental game issues that can plague you and can be the thing that might you might be starting to see kind of calling, pulling you back and kind of you know hearing almost like the echoes of them in in the back of your mind like the the tantalizing voices saying you know trying to seduce you back into bad behavior you have to not just know what those are right many of you know what your problems are but you need to spend some time actually dissecting that and and fairly shortly i'm going to give you a tool that you can use uh to do that but it's not really useful to have, have you know to, to start working with this tool until you know specifically what those mistakes are. So I've said I've got kind of a lot of theory here. Practically speaking, what I would make sure you do is write down all of the mistakes that you you are are kind of anticipate making in this spot now. Right? Maybe they're not exactly all the mistakes that you've made before, but there's a handful that you can see more likely coming. Like right? the the signs are there. So, and, and, and I'm, I'm not, I'm talking about maybe mostly like the trading mistakes, because once you start with the trading mistakes, then you can start to look at what emotions are likely to be present there. Is it greed? Is it anger? Is it fear or FOMO? Is it more related to confidence and overthinking? Uh, is it related to overconfidence? What, what are the emotions that are likely to be present when uh, you're going to be making those mistakes? And that begins, you know, your ability to then use the tool I'm going to show you very shortly. But uh, again, I think what you're trying to do right now is to game plan against those mistakes. We're not going to say that they're guaranteed to happen, but you are likely to be continually tested. And you want to make sure that you can pass that test, right? Be able to kind of upgrade your reactions in those moments. 
All right, next question. Um, how do you manage distractions while waiting for a trade? I find myself getting bored and watching YouTube videos, uh, but by doing it, I end up missing some trades uh, or trades I would like to take. Uh, so Jack, if you can share my screen here, because there is a, a, a very helpful uh, uh, theory out there called the Yerkes Dotson Law. Okay, and what you can see here is uh, the relationship between performance and stress, emotion. Psychologists call it arousal, right? Call it talking back in the 1900s, early 1900s. But the bottom line is like emotion, energy, right? You need a certain amount of it to get to your peak, right? If you are lacking energy, which is what's happening for you here, right? You're kind of falling down the left side of that curve. You don't have enough energy. You don't have enough focus, motivation interest or emotion to drive your performance higher and keep you there. And so then conversely, right, maybe the uh, trader who asked the previous question, right, is dealing with emotion that takes them down the other side of the curve, right, where now your emotions are running too hot, right? And then and that actually shuts down higher brain function. You're not thinking as well. You're not planning as well. You're not uh, making decisions as well. But the exact same thing happens when your energy is too low. So in both cases, Energy is too low, energy is too high, emotions are too low, emotions are too high, you suck, okay? What we're trying to do is drive our way higher. And so, you know, if you're on the, the, the right side of the curve, you're trying to reduce that emotion to get yourself back. And for you, you are trying to generate more energy. So how are you gonna do that? Well, now that you know that that's the problem, right? I, I would say, you know, trying to solve for the distractions, I would say is less impactful than trying to focus on boosting your energy more consistently. And you do that through your goals. If you want to have more energy, just look at what you're trying to accomplish. Like, why does it matter that you want to take lots of successful trades? We, we sort of know what that is, obviously, but in that moment, it gets lost and you get sucked into goals and motivations that are, you know, the antithesis of it, which is, I want to be entertained at all times. I want to be interested at all times, right? That could be a driving motivation for you. It's, you know, not really obvious until it becomes problematic, until there's a conflict between I want to make a lot of money and I want to be interested at all times. Well, how does that, how do you reconcile that with trading? It's easy. You want to make money more than you want to be interested at all times, okay? And so that becomes how you're, you're sort of driving yourself forward. So now what practically can you be doing at those times? I would try to come up with a game plan. What, what, what are you going to do with that at, at those times? Now, maybe you can watch a YouTube video for two or three minutes, right? So you might curate, you know, a selection of videos that you can watch. And once one is complete, then you go back and you focus on trading for the next 10 to 15 minutes, right? And maybe there's some, some tasks that you could do, right? Where you could even do some back testing or look at other charts or, you know, do a little bit of reading or research, right? There's specific tasks that you want to anchor your mind to so that you're not getting completely distracted. One of the biggest problems that I see, and this is not just exclusive to traders, it happens with a variety of professionals that I work with, whether it be poker players or golfers, it, it can be easy to allow your focus to drop too far down because you get so engrossed in that YouTube video or you know other things that may, may kind of uh, capture your interest. And then it becomes very hard to just kind of turn it on like that right? To just jump instantly from, let's say, level 20 to all the way back up to 50, right? So the practical steps I've given you are trying to allow you to, to let your focus wane a little bit at times, but then it's easy to kind of snap back in when you need to. All right. Uh, so the next question here, uh, I'm going to bring up in a second uh, another uh, image here. Uh, let me read the question first. Um, often on a, on a winning streak or after a big win, I begin to start trading more loose and relaxed. This is often good, but it can also easily fall into not following my trading plan and rules because I have the mentality I'm up big and can afford to take more risks. However, this can easily lead to over trading, over positioning size and revenge trading. Do you have any practical advice on how I can prevent this? So, you know, we're looking at this graphic here. What, where, where are they landing? I can promise you there's overconfidence at play here, okay? I, I, I begin to start trading more loose and relaxed. You think that it's that your relaxation is that your energy is dropping, but it's more that you're not relaxed on a physical level. You're now kind of pumped with adrenaline and, and you know, uh, 
too much confidence, right? The, the overconfidence is now kind of blinding you almost as if like you're a little drunk here. Okay. And so this is uh, the tool that I want you to use. Okay. This is what's called a mental hand history. And what I mentioned before to the first uh, trader, you know, how are you going to defend against your bad habits? You're going to do a mental hand history for each of the individual mistakes or bad habits uh, that you typically fall into. Okay. And the mental hand history is basically just a problem solving tool. Don't, don't get too hung up on the name. It's something that, that I kind of uh, created when I was working with poker players where they would typically send a hand history, right? A complete record, almost like a trade, uh, it, uh, you know, looking at your trade journal and, and sending a, one of your individual trades to a coach or a mentor to get feedback on it. Poker players would send the hand history to a coach to get feedback on it. So, you know, with my clients, I have them send a mental hand history. Okay. It's just a name. Don't, don't worry. It's a, it's a tool to problem solve, to get at the deeper causality that's going on here. So, you know, without going into too much detail on the, the, the tool itself, let's just use an example to kind of help you learn what that looks like. Okay. So the first step is to describe the problem in detail, which I've done with the first beginning of this question. And I've highlighted the, the section there that says, when I'm up big and can afford to take more risk. When, when traders are typically kind of completing this task, they will tend to get too focused on the technical rationale, okay, as we move through, through, through the different steps. And it's really important that you are focused on the mental and emotional side of this, because if you don't get to that side of it, you're not really going to solve the problem. Now, you may, maybe there's both, right? Maybe there's the technical reason, which I think very easily could be true for you, right? Some technical weaknesses that need to be cleaned up. But, you know, if we're not getting the mental side, you know, it, it requires a combination of both generally in situations like this to truly be able to solve it, okay? Now, the second step of the mental hand history, right? you define the problem clearly. The second step is to define why it makes logical sense that you would think, feel, or react this way. And this is a question that traders have a very hard time with. Frankly, people have a hard time with this because when they're making emotionally based decisions, they just naturally assume that it's illogical or irrational. Okay. And that is only true because it, so it only feels that way because you are lacking the underlying rationale and reasoning and logic for why that behavior, that mistake, that action, that thought, that emotion makes sense. Okay. When you start to dig your way into your reactions, into your mistakes, into your bad habits, you will find underlying flaws, biases, wishes, illusions, hopes. The trader has asked a question that include the word hope in here. Okay. Hope is dangerous. Illusions are dangerous. Flaws are obviously dangerous. So for example, you might find like an illusion of control, high expectations, the confirmation bias. Right. Hindsight bias. Oh my, I mean, traders are notorious for the hindsight bias. Oh, I should have bought Bitcoin in 2013, right? I was around it or in 2016. I mean, you know, there's so many instances. I, obviously, I, you know, a couple of years ago when Buffett bought Apple, I should have bought Apple and just gone long. It, it's just so easy in hindsight because you have perfect information, right? But to create from, to generate hindsight into foresight is a completely different thing. And so hindsight would be another example of these underlying flaws, biases, wishes that we're looking to find. Okay. Now to get there, right? That, that piece of it is in step three, but to get there, we need to understand the underlying rationale. Okay. And so for you, why does it make sense that when you were up big, you believe that you can afford to take more risk? Okay. And I gave a couple examples that might be true for you, right? This, this feeling like you're playing with house money, right? doesn't feel either even though it's sort of realized in your account, right? It's not unrealized profit, but it may be not realized in terms of, you know, your actual personal bank account, right? The money doesn't feel tangible or real yet. It hasn't, you know, taken on any real quality to it. So, you know, kind of like a gambler, you know, playing with house money, you feel like you can take more risk and uh, can afford to do that because you're not actually losing your money there, right? And so then it kind of gets to the second point, which is that a lot of people, not just, not just traders, a lot of people are motivated more by not losing than they are by winning. And some of this comes down to something that Daniel Kahneman, right? Thinking fast and slow, the godfather of cognitive biases, found that something called prospect theory affects many, many people. Okay. Prospect theory says that people tend to be more motivated to avoid losing than they are to win. Why? Because losing hurts more 
then winning feels good. So you're more avoidant of pain than you are aspiring towards those good feelings. And why? Because that dynamic kind of makes that the ratio not quite equal. So maybe you are less motivated to truly achieve the goals that you want to accomplish and aspire to in trading. You're less motivated by that than you are to avoid losing. And so when you're not losing, then, well, you can do whatever you want, because why not? You're not losing. So now we get to step three of this problem, right? And then this is where you get to describe the flaw in your logic. This is where you get to like really define what is wrong with your thinking? What is wrong with your reactions? Okay. And then we get to step four and step five, which I haven't completed because I'm not going to go through a, you know, a, a kind of a full uh, assumption here. I could be completely wrong um, in terms of like what the logic is, right? You can't complete steps three and four until you truly understand uh, step two, right? And the same thing with step four. You can't do step four until you truly understand what the underlying flaw, bias, wish, illusion is, okay? And then step five is... A bit of a bonus right here it's like why is the correction in step four correct well it's going to add a bit of potency behind it okay all of you would be benefited from completing mental hand histories okay it's a, not a very complicated tool in, in in theory the the complication comes in that you know you're just kind of limited in your knowledge which is like the the mental game of trading was written to help you to to complete this because when you're able to kind of target the root cause, right? The underlying reason, the causality for why the problems that you see on the surface exist, then you can truly correct them and truly upgrade your perspective, truly transform a lot of the reactions and mistakes that you make. Otherwise, if you don't do this, you are condemned to managing them, patchworking it, right? The first question, I've got these habits and they seem to be coming back. Yeah. If you pull a, 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 a weed out, but don't get the roots, it's just going to keep coming back. And this is why so many of you get sucked back under this bad behavior and mistakes and, and issues, right? It's because you're not really understanding the underlying causality. So the mental hand history is a tool to transform your perspective, transform your emotional reactions so that you can automatically be more calm, more stable, more disciplined, right? All right. Rant over. Get to work. <laughs> Okay. And Jack, you can stop uh, the screen share there. All right. Next question. Um, how can I stop over trading? Um, how to protect my daily profit? There you go. Throw that right into step one of the mental hand history, right? Because you need to understand what's driving it, right? Why are you over trading, right? Maybe it's a bit of greed. Well, what's driving the greed? Maybe there's this feeling that it's never good enough, right? There's no amount of money that's going to make you feel satisfied. Maybe then you're, you're kind of managing a confidence issue, some perfectionism, right? Those are some examples of what is driving the overtrading, but those are questions that you have to ask for yourself and be really coldly honest, right? It's easy to BS somebody else. Sometimes it's even easy to BS ourselves, but look in the mirror and ask yourself, why am I overtrading? What is driving that behavior? And once you start to nail down that why, right, that's step two, right, then you can start to get to the underlying flaw in terms of what's wrong here. And again, you may get some technical reason for it, right? So well, obviously, well, taking this many trades is not profitable and I'm not taking profitable trades, uh, you know, sure. But what's, what's the emotional driver for it? Maybe there's just this like deep desire to make an absolute ton of money, right? So of course it would make sense that you would be driven that hard to make it, but maybe it's not just the drive to make a ton of money. Maybe it's to make a ton of money now. Maybe there's an urgency behind it. And so then you lose all sort of the practical, pragmatic steps that are, are required, right? And understanding of the ups and downs, like your your account can't just go, you know, kind of parabolic, right? Much like trades, right? Need to kind of keep forming these bases of support in order to like truly sort of sustain a, uh, a rally right? It's the same for, for you, right? You need your confidence. You need your skill set to continue to climb in order to support those big aspirations. Again, I'm just kind of theorizing for you, but, you know, generally speaking, everything I just said can apply to many of you. How do you keep emotions out of trading? You can't and you shouldn't, okay? Um, it's, a, it's a myth, right? Go back to that performance stress curve. Jack, you want to throw that back up there again? Um, to be at the peak, right? The very top of that, you need emotion. You need energy, Okay. Emotion, when it gets 
contaminated by flaws and biases, that's what kind of converts it into volatility, right? Almost like a combustible chemical, right? That, that the, the anger starts to blow up in your mind. So yeah, you want to get rid of the anger, right? But sometimes for some people, anger is actually quite productive, right? Here, we're talking about increasing intensity. I can promise you there are many, many uh, professional athletes. I mean, Michael Jordan maybe is the most famous, who was motivated by anger, motivated by revenge, absolutely like convinced himself that, you know, people were kind of out to get him, were against him, slighted him. Uh, and, you know, if you watch the, 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 the last dance, saw that there were examples that were truly untrue, but he needed it because he'd become dependent on it to fuel his best. He needed that emotion. And so when you look at other athletes, like, they come out flat sometimes, right? And there's not enough energy there. Well, yes, as a trader, you're not, you know, out there competing like football players, right? Where you need that emotion and it's a physical game and it's, but you see football players get too emotional and it becomes problematic, right? So like, there's a level for you and for, for traders where your emotions are necessary to drive that optimal performance. And so I think your question is more, how do you, solve for all of the excessive emotion that becomes problematic where you get down that right side of that curve. That is what I want you to game plan for. And so how are you going to do that? You're going to list out all of the instances where emotions cause problems, right? And let's say it's fear. Let's say it's some FOMO. Let's say there's a little bit of uh, greed and overconfidence when things are going well, right? Use the things I've already started to say here today and begin to create a game plan against each of those individual things, right? You're not battling against emotion. You're battling up against excessive emotion, which is generated by underlying flaws, biases, wishes, illusions, hopes, bleh, right? All that crap is what's driving the excessive emotion. All right, Jack, you can end that there. Uh, next question. Um, how can I manage my trading after a bad, uh, bad family news? Uh, dad has cancer, has only one year left. Uh, I've blown two funded accounts already uh, since he told me. Um, so. Uh, my God, uh, uh, my condolences and, and best to your family um, in this. So let's get you a, a bit more kind of cleaned up here uh, and, and ready to trade. So first off, you might be dealing with some, you know, baseline emotion that, you know, needs to be addressed in a very kind of practical, personal family way, right? You might not be dealing with the emotion around uh, the news of your father, you know, in a, in a, in a practical way. I mean, and that, that can be very, very difficult to do because like we've never been in a situation like this before and you're kind of grieving before you grieve, you know, it, there's obviously time, but there's loss already. And so you need to deal with it practically part a part B when it comes time to trade. Okay. What I would strongly suggest is about an hour before you would typically begin trading, you're going to spend, up to 15 minutes. You can't do more than that. And I probably for you would suggest maybe even up to 10 minutes. You're going to write down some thoughts that you're having about your dad, emotions that are there. And again, it can, it can be a, a, a wide variety. They can change day to day. Okay. But the things that are kind of most pressing, most uh, kind of close to you at that point, you're going to write them down. And the reason you're going to do that is because you're going to draw a line in your mind, right? Almost like a line in the sand that says, okay, from this point until the trading day is over, I am not going to think about him. And I'm not going to think about anything related to, uh, to his, you know, sort of the family situation. And yes, I understand this is easier said than done, but if you've done the work, you know, kind of outside of, uh, to deal with more of the personal stuff, you've done this, it's okay to give yourself a break. It's okay to give yourself like a mini vacation from the raw, you know, sort of situation and the pain that you're experiencing. It's actually healthy because you're going to be able to be a better man, be a better person. I right? say man, but maybe you're a woman, right? Be a better person, uh, you know, for your family afterwards by having these little breaks, right? When you're sort of consumed by it, it's not healthy for anybody. Right? And obviously it's having an effect on your trading. So you get lots of benefits from this, right? You get a little mini vacation, you get to trade, enjoy yourself, right? And, and, and if you are able to kind of create the bubble that I've described, then at the end, when you go back to those things that you wrote down, 
uh, you know, and kind of put on the side, you're going to come back to them and come back to your dad in a way that's going to feel a bit more uh, grounded and may, maybe still very emotional, would, but, but in, in like more of a, a, a kind of healthy way. Okay? I'm not saying this is easy. I am saying that as you do this sort of day in and day out, you will get better at it and being able to kind of create that space for yourself. And, but the bottom line is like, you got to do that, that kind of personal uh, work on the, on the side, like whether it's on, you know, nights, weekends, or just taking days off from trading. Um, Cause otherwise the emotions will be just too raw. Right. And any little thing is going to just like spark, uh, you know, some intense uh, emotional volatility for you. All right. Uh, next question. I'll just check our time here. We got plenty of time. Um, how do I unveil the thinking brain? Uh, when in a trade, I lose thinking capacity, even in a combine, not live money accounts. I mean, you're too emotional, right? Emotions can make you dumb. <laughs> We've all been there, myself included. Emotions can make you dumb. And and so that's that's what you're kind of battling with because everything I've said so far today firmly fits in with uh, what you're trying to do here. It's like, what emotions are affecting you, right? The thinking is gone. So the emotional system, right, when it gets overactive, has the power to shut down higher brain function. And that includes thinking, okay? Right, that whiteboard in your mind where you have thoughts, right? That shrinks in proportion to how much emotion has kind of crossed that, that curve, right? How much you're accelerating, even up to the point where if you are 100 out of 100, that that's where the blue screen in your mind comes in, right? That's the blind panic, the blind rage, right? Those words blind in there, I think are quite, uh, you know, illustrative of the severity of the, the emotion that's present at that time. So much so that your thinking part of the brain is completely shut down. And neurologically speaking, that is true. When you take a brain scan of somebody, it's like, it's like dead inside. Now it's not completely, but you know, that that's effectively what's happened. And we can see in a brain scan too, that one of those mental functions, uh, you know, in that higher brain function is, is actually used for emotional control. Okay. And, and when people are in an MRI, actively trying to suppress their emotions. It's called the prefrontal cortex. It's right in the front part of your brain. It is actively trying to suppress and control those emotions, right? You can see it's red hot when the emotional system is not intensely overactive, right? When it's sort of, you know, active, uh, or sorry to say overactive, uh, but still manageable. But then when it gets overactive, even that prefrontal cortex, you know, becomes inactivated, right? And you no longer can control your emotions. So that's why it's so important uh, to, you know, better understand and have a game plan for what you're defending against with your emotions. Right. And right now it's all kind of just a blur, perhaps, right. You need to be very specific about, you know, what emotions are being triggered. What are the situations that are, are, are being triggered, are triggering that emotion, right? Uh, what maybe thoughts are coming up in that moment? Uh, how are your actions or behaviors changing based on the situation? How is your decision-making from a trading standpoint changing, right? All of this helps you to kind of collect data around these situationally. And then eventually you can kind of create a bit of a map where it like asks like, all right, well, what was going on before the emotions became overactive and before I lost my thinking? Because that's where you want to start to take action while you still retain that prefrontal cortex, while you still retain the ability to have emotional control. Because once that's gone, all the big mistakes that you make are basically inevitable. They are going to happen. Uh, why is meditation helpful for a trader? So I'm not a massive proponent of meditation. Okay. I think there are some people for whom they kind of promote meditation as like an answer. And I don't see it as that, uh, in a lot of my work, but that's just kind of my bias. However, I do see meditation as a tool and specifically as a tool to train, uh, your focus, uh, to train your self-awareness and to train uh, a bit more of uh, let's call it like kind of mental strength, right? The kind of mental strength that you need for discipline. So all of those things can be aided from meditation, you know, kind of like a workout for the mind, right? If you're going to go lift weights, right? Meditation is kind of like that. All right. Um, and Hoag, if you want to jump into this question um, to see if you have any thoughts here um, from a scale of one to 10, um, how important uh, is it for a new trader to use a trade journal system? What's the best way to use that system? Uh, my opinion here is uh, it's a hundred out of ten. <laughs> because I mean, you've got to uh, the journaling is essential. Period. Right at all stages of of trading. Right, and so yeah, build good habits at the beginning. 
Uh, because otherwise, like, how are you going to have any sense of kind of accountability and sense of feedback on a regular basis on how you're doing? Uh, so curious to know your thoughts there, Hogan, and, and kind of what, what you would suggest in terms of the system. I'm with you 10,000% on that, Jared. Any trader, no matter what level of experience or success or, or lack of success they, they're currently experiencing, yes, you have to journal. And I feel like we say this all the time. Everybody says that they journal, but I, I would I would suspect that probably 80% of people that say they're journaling are not. Like Jared said, you've got to journal, you've got to have some sort of a record, whether it's stream of consciousness, whether there's, you know, there's, there's all kinds of tools out there to use to journal your trades. There's the facts of the trade. I bought it here because of this and then this and then this. And then, and then there's the other side of it is, you know, what is going on inside of you during those trades? And if you don't account for them and if you don't review them, you're basically just slowing your learning curve by by not doing it. It's so important for traders to do that. I'm going to take a second and kind of mention uh, the the whoever it was that uh, found out the bad news about their dad. Number one, of course, you know we're, we're all praying for his and your family's comfort. Um, I, you know, I lost my dad in a while back. I lost my mom a little over a year ago. Um, so I'm kind of used to the the the, the idea of trying to separate that from, from trading. And I found myself almost feeling guilty because I wasn't thinking about it and I wasn't, you know, um, you know, just kind of trying to heal from it, whatever it is. And it occurred to me that you, you don't feel guilty about doing that. Don't feel, your dad wants you to succeed. My dad wants me to succeed. My mom wants me to succeed. And they want us to do the things that are going to be a benefit to us, no, no, no matter what. I mean, as a as a parent myself, you know, I want my kids to succeed, and I will do anything in my power, and I will enable them to do anything that's in their power to succeed. So, don't you know? Be, uh, be, be gentle on yourself, and and you know, as difficult as it's going to be to separate yourself from that from that situation, don't feel guilty about it. Yeah, that's great. That's great advice, uh, John. And uh, yeah, sorry about your mom, man. I mean, it's um, you're right. A lot of people do feel guilty in those situations, and yeah, to have the 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 freedom to be able to continue to live is ultimately what they would want. Um, and hundred uh, percent. Yeah, there's a there's a degree. I mean, obviously, like you go the extreme opposite and like have no care. Well, that's not healthy or even. Mm -hmm you know, optimal either, right? There's a, there is a balance. There's a father and, you know, kind of finding that can be tricky if you haven't gone through it before. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Good stuff. So let's move on to the next question here. Um, I appreciate, uh, my question revolves around breaking past a profit level. Currently I'm in the 50 K trading combine. I reached the 2000 profit level three times. And each time I would hit my daily loss limit, uh, shortly following the hit, hitting the two, the two K profit level. I was able to recover uh, two times, but the last time I hit my maximum drawdown and lost my combine. Uh, I would only trade one lot trades, but when I was close to losing my combines, the second time I took a chance and increased my lot size. I back tested with two to three lots and was having some success. From then on, I decided to try larger lot sizes. I think this is what accelerated my last drawdown. Instead of taking one lot trades, I would take two to three, hoping, there was that word I mentioned before, hoping I would make back what I had lost. I've noticed my tilt increase when I put on a trade exit early because I was fearing hitting stop loss. Then my original hypothesis turned out to be correct. FOMO would increase exponentially. Then I would force trades with two lots and hit my stop loss, usually in the opposite direction, yada, yada, yada. We all know this level of chaos that can ensue. So what's the problem here, right? I'm not saying that hope is the only problem that's happening here, but I am saying that when it is present, and another version of this is something that I would call the efforts, right? And this is kind of it, right? It's easy when you're kind of down to just say effort and you throw the Hail Mary and you try to kind of gamble your way back to profitability, gamble your way back to either maintaining or even passing a combine. And were you to be successful, right? What are you actually gaining? You know, it sort of suggests that you're hoping either for confidence or money. And that's commonly what I see. You're, you're hoping 
by that kind of gamble that you're going to get either of those two things. And if you do, well, guess what? You've gained some money that's temporary, right? Lottery winners, 80% of them go broke in three or five years. And why is that? Well, because they don't have any skill managing money, you know, and they don't know how to manage this, the, the pressures, right? The classic more money, more problems, right? And all of the things that kind of come with it, they don't have the skill. So if you're going to gamble to make money in trading, what have you done? You've reinforced bad habits. But in our mind, it's very easy to think, well, I've got the money now. I passed the combine. Now I should be good. <laughs> no, and not if you don't have the skill. You've actually made yourself less likely to be successful by gambling your way to get there. Okay. In the moment, it doesn't feel that way because that hope has convinced you, right? The, the lack of confidence has convinced you that by getting the outcomes that you want, you can change and prove. So you can change yourself psychologically and you can prove that you have the skill to trade. Okay. Yeah, you have the skill to trade, but are you a trader, right? Have you actually harnessed and, and focused your skill sets in the right way when it is hard? Who can tell you? I mean, you're in the trenches and it is really, really easy to succumb to bad behavior. But when you do that, that's how you either have some of your biggest blowouts or you truly don't gain anything um, having kind of done that correct, done that so poorly. And it is kind of the classic like weightlifting analogy here, right? When it is hard, that's how you know that it's there's a lot to gain, right? We don't want it to be like an insurmountable weight for you to push here. But I don't think what you're asking yourself for is truly that hard. It feels hard, right? It's like last couple reps in a in a set, but what a set that you can do. But the hope is a give up, and and it it, it actually reinforces and and uh, perpetuates a lack of confidence in your strategy. You need to double down on it and pass the combine the right way. All right, next question. Um, I work a full-time job that's super demanding and causes a lot of stress. That stress bleeds into my trading and how I trade. Do you have any tips on how to handle that stress uh, to where it doesn't affect my trading? Kind of like the personal issue, right? The dad thing um, where you've got some either stress or emotion that needs to be kind of put, it, put away. So what you're doing is you're kind of doing a cool down. Right. You're giving your mind a chance to kind of decompress by taking those notes. So practically speaking, maybe there are thoughts that are kind of still in your mind at, about your job. Maybe there are tasks that need to get done tomorrow. And there's, you know, either a need to kind of write down those tasks or write down some of the thoughts that you've had about them. But I can promise you that some of the fatigue that you feel having made that transition from that demanding job to trading, some of the fatigue that you feel is not physical fatigue, it's what I would call bloated brain. Okay. And traders experience this too, right? When you're at the end of a trading day or even at the end of a trading week, if you're not properly doing that trade journal, right? Properly digesting and, and kind of decompressing from trading day over day, right? You're going to feel more fatigued because you got more stuff crammed in your head. So here you are in a super demanding job at the end of that, right? The momentum of all that data, right, is still in your head. You don't have the space of the room to now interface with the markets in a way that you truly is absorbed, you, where you can absorb market data and make decisions, right? You don't have any room. It's like a sponge. It's too saturated. How, how are you going to put any more water in that thing? You got to squeeze some of that water out, make some room in that sponge. And that's what you got to do at the end of that trading, uh, sorry, the, at the end of your job. Maybe even throughout your daily job, you're going to take five, you know, two to five minutes to take some notes down. So the accumulation of that is not so profound at the end of the day that you're just now consumed. It's going to take you, you know, a half hour to an hour to kind of fully, uh, you know, uh, ch ch change direction, right? Because you got to do the cool down. Then you got to give yourself some time to rest. Then you got to get yourself reoriented to trading, get your motivations aligned, get your strategy kind of warmed up and aligned, game plan against any emotions that may be present, right? Things like that. So you got to make that transition. Right? You're trying to turn on a dime and it's like trying to tr turn a cruise ship, right? It's, this is not like, you know, a car where you just turn around and go the other direction, right? You can't just get done with that job and immediately start trading without having any kind of uh, process for that. And what I've just given you is, is one that can work. 
Uh, outside of drafting the trading plan, uh, do you have any tips to get your mind prepared to be disciplined and emotionally centered for the trading session? So, I mean, what I was just beginning to sort of talk about now is exactly that, right? What does that warm up look like for trading? Uh, for me, from an emotional side, you're reviewing your goals, not just the headlines, but the whys behind your goals. Why do you care about making this amount of money? Why do you care about, you know, goals don't always have to be P&L related. It could be, you know, I want uh, a certain level of proficiency and execution with my, my strategy, right? I've got clients who will, you know, set, uh, you know, kind of a, a benchmark, right? Where they want to have 20 trades in a row that are executed perfectly. And it's kind of like that, you know, classic, you know, how many days to last accident in a, in a manufacturing facility, right? And every day where there isn't one, they throw up that number, right? How many trades can you go before, uh, you know, disaster strikes, right? And so that's, that becomes like a top line goal, okay? And then like the why behind that, what's, what's really driving that motivation? The why is really key because it helps to kind of further narrow your focus on the trading day, right? Keep your mind centered around trading and making it the most important thing in your life at that point. Now, is it the most important thing in your life? Probably not. But at this point in time, it is. And that's okay. Like, allow it that way. And if there are things that can tend to bleed in, right, and be distractive, be distracting, right, you got to block that stuff out right? This needs to be the only thing that matters in your life. And if there are emergencies, obviously you can find a way to be accessed. But for the most part, it's like, you got to make this rock solid and your goals are the primary way to kind of create that, that insulation, create that focus, like a, like a laser beam in a sense, right? So goals, why behind your goals, read them, review them. You're not making them spontaneously on the moment, right? You, they shouldn't be that new every single day. Right? Okay. Number one, number two, once you got your focus narrowed, now you're going to, let's say, okay, drafting the trading plan, sure. But now you got to review your game plan to defend against the big mistakes that are typically going to occur in executing that trading plan, right? Is it FOMO? Is it greed? Is it anger? Is it boredom and distractions? Is it, you know, the inability to sit in your hands? Is it, you know, uh, just the, the tantalizing pressure that it, ta it takes to like sustain these like mind eating trades that just won't either stop you out or hit your target and you can't, right? So you kind of bail out prematurely just because you can't handle the uncertainty, right? What are the problems? What are the situations? You've got to have a game plan for that. If you don't have a game plan, then you, you got to create it so you can do this as part of your warm up. Cause then you're basically kind of going in like hoping to be able to defend against those problems, right? The game plan mentally and emotionally is equal to your trading plan from a, a technical standpoint, right? You need to know and understand like what you are defending against, or if you're trying to beat your best more often, like what are those factors that help to produce it, right? And have a game plan for that as well. Okay. Right. Mental, emotional stuff is not random. I think many of you may maybe feel like it is because you haven't taken the time to see the predictability in it, right? Just like many non-traders who know nothing about TA would say, oh, well, the market's random. Like, how could you possibly make money? You're just getting lucky. Well, yeah, I, 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 I'm not like, uh, there's a, it's a probability game, right? Yes. There's luck involved in the short term, but if I've developed a strategy that's proven to be profitable long-term, right, it can, you know, move through different market regimes and still churn out a profit margin, you know, much like a slot machine, right? Built an edge, but I'm here now. I'm the slot machine. I'm the one that's got to be executing this. So if you got that kind of strategy, well, in what way can that slot machine get impaired, right? As you as the engine of, or not the engine, but you as the executor of that strategy. Well, that's what you got to be defending against. All right. Uh, I have a few good days and then one to two bad days and give back all my profits and more. Is this a self-sabotaging overconfidence, greed, or euphoric problem? Uh, yes. <laughs> I... I mean, I think given the question that came in before, right, overconfidence is typically the thing that happens most often. The one thing I would correct though is self-sabotage self is a completely BS term. It should be deleted from the planet uh, because the only true self-sabotage comes when you have enough skill to actually be able to undercut your own abilities. What you were describing and what many people describe when they say self-sabotage, which I say again is BS, also because it implies a level of self-control as if you are doing it to yourself, which is freaking overconfident. You do not have control over undercutting your own 
success. You're undercutting your own abilities. Nobody, no one does that. Okay, the only one that I've seen, you know, is is like a comedian who, like a Chris Farley, like can undercut his own right success for com- maximum comedic effect. I don't mean that in you know the demise of his career and his life. I mean that in terms of like his actual stage physical comedy, where he would, you know, physically do things to uh, look dumb, but what is uh, amazingly uh, funny, right? That that's like a self sabotage. This, this is not self sabotage. You don't have control. So what you've got to do is better understand what those impulses are driven by. All the things I've mentioned so far today, you know, kind of firmly fit in that category. All right. Um, I normally trade high volume profiles with uh, value high low and POC. Always do great in the sim, but not in the combines. As I'm going through my journey the last few months, my weakness is to come out of a position with little profit rather than wait to hit target based on my analysis. What's your one advice uh, for me? Uh, the fact that you're looking for one piece of advice is actually the problem because you think that there's magic in a bottle. Easy solutions can be found. Yeah. It's my bad uh, Vegas stage uh, singing. Um, no, there's no like silver bullets here. You can't like that, 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 that does not exist for complicated problems. Now I'll give you a piece of advice, which is, like treat the combine, treat the, the sim, right? As like live trading and better understand and map profile, the problems that you're experiencing, solve them the way I've talked about today, right? There is something unique though about the sim and about, you know, actually trading for real, which is right, you may not be as well conditioned for the inherent stress and pressure uh, that trading exposes and brings out, right? Here you are uh, watching an NFL game and then tomorrow, uh, you know, you get, plucked in GM makes the call says, Hey, uh, we need a kicker. You're in. Okay. Now you got to kick a 40 yarder for, uh, uh, to win a game for you, the, the team that you love. How are you going to do it? You're, gonna, you're telling me that that would happen to you and you wouldn't feel any pressure <laughs> or an overwhelming amount with 80,000 people plus millions watching on TV. Of course you would. Well, many of you have cash and you're like, Oh yeah, I want to go play in the NFL. Right, here's my cash. Uh, let's throw me in coach. And that's what you're doing when you're joining these out. It's like you are entering a marketplace that is the most competitive in the world that exposes underlying weaknesses and vulnerabilities with very seasoned, successful traders. And you think you're going to show up without feeling any stress or pressure. And it's just going to be kind of easy in a cakewalk. You got to be delusional for that to be true. So part of this is just getting yourself conditioned to the natural intensity that is part of trading and having it be okay. But then not having, not having that inherent pressure and intensity wear on your strategy. So part of this is probably that you also need to strengthen not necessarily the tactics that you're using. Now, that may very well be true, but your internalization of it, right? Could I wake you up at 3 a.m. and have you tell me what it is like that? My guess is no, which tells me that it's not ready for prime time and being able to be tested under the bright lights of, uh, of real trading. Now we've got time for a few more questions here. Um, uh, is finding a strategy and sticking to it uh, all it takes to become an expert trader? I found my strategy and it seems to be working, uh, back testing it for about three months. I even pass a combine uh, with it as well. And all that, all, all, right, left now is to control my emotions. <laughs> but it just seems so good to be true. And pure beginner's luck and a losing strike uh, will come back and leave me broke. Uh, what do you suggest? And overall, uh, keep looking for other strategies to use in parallel with mine, or just stick to my strategy. John, I'm sure you've got some thoughts here, but for, from a mental emotional standpoint, right? All that is left to can do is control your emotions. Makes it again, I think, a bit too sort of simple for uh, you know, kind of what this actually is, right? There's a continual evolution tactically and mentally that's going to occur, right? There is no sort of solving it. So yeah, don't just uh, simplify even just the mental and emotional side because there is complexity. You know, we've talked, talked about a variety of compl- complex issues here. Uh, these are things that are not going to get solved in a day, a week, likely a month, right? Long standing habits take some time to really understand before you even game plan. And then once you create a game plan, then you got to test it, see how well it's going to go. And that's the ca- same kind of thing you've done on a trading side. So I, I'd say, you know, kind of getting yourself in a position where uh, you can have more control, have more command with your emotions is, is a great next step. Uh, but you know, there, 
you got to be prepared for an ongoing evolution uh, with your your trading strategy as well. What do you think they're doing? Um, Jared, uh, can you re reiterate the first part of that question, if you wouldn't mind? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. So I think the, the, the idea here was, um, right. You know, testing kind of a strategy for three months, you know, uh, but it seems sort of too good to be true. Like he's doing well, uh, but has this kind of fear that like a losing streak is going to leave him broke and, uh, you know, it just kind of feels like beginner's luck. So there's, I feel like there's there's some element of like novelty that to the strategy, but like a feeling like there's like it, it could, it's all kind of, uh, you know, could easily kind of fall between your hands, like a, like grabbing, grabbing a, a handful of sand. Right. Right. And you know, that's, it's all happened to me in the past. So, um, you know, what it sounds like is he, he's really aligned with the market state with the current strategies in. Um, and it will change. The markets will change. I always say that, you know, when, when the, when you get the right answers, eventually the market's going to change the questions. The question then becomes, how do I recognize when that change occurs? Well, it could be a series of losses. It could be a series of days of losses, but the one thing you don't want to do is continue to, to trade a strategy that is now proving uh, you know, not, not profitable. It's, you know, it's of course subjective. You, you don't want to abandon a strategy that's working. You may need to change uh, one little gentle trajectory of that strategy. You, you, you know, uh, if the market's range bound, I'm usually a very good trader. I'm focusing on the extremes, fading those extremes until proven wrong. When the market's directional, I have a harder time and I know this. So I try and, you know, be selective in, in the opportunities. Um, you know, it, 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 when that strategy is working, work the hell out of it. Don't, don't worry about when it's going to change, work it until it changes and then make your gentle trajectory changes in it. Yeah, that's great. All right. Maybe we got time for one more question. Um, so uh, maybe, or maybe two, it's this first, this next one could be, uh, uh, what is your dominant internal voice, mostly positive or negative? Um, if positive, is it natural or trained? Um, I, I would say people tend to have a dominant style, right? Um, neither is bad. Okay. And, and you might think that negative thinking is bad, but there is research to show that quote, like negative thinking for certain types of people, is actually quite good, okay? And they did this with research for, uh, you know, uh, people kind of learning to throw darts. And so people who were defined as like kind of being more naturally optimistic, uh, if you gave them positive reinforcement while they were learning darts, they did better than when they got negative reinforcement. And then on the flip side, people that were naturally pessimistic, if you gave them positive feedback while they're learning to throw darts, they would actually learn worse, their performance yeah. went down, versus when you would give them kind of constructive criticism and feedback. So negative and positive thinking, they're not good or bad. It kind of depends on who you are and your, your predominant style. Mm -hmm. Me personally, I would say I'm like an opportunist, right? I'm a pragmatist. You know, there are times where I might be, you know, positive and feel good and, you know, kind of have thoughts that are kind of aligned with that, but I'm never, you know, I'm, I'm kind of cautious that I can get overconfident because that, that is something that can happen for me. And then the flip side, when I've, you know, F up and make mistakes, like the criticism is pointed, you know, it's never like demeaning. I'm not getting mad at myself. I'm getting mad at the action. I'm getting mad at what happened. And then I'm using that as fuel to understand what the heck happened so that I can correct it and make sure that it doesn't happen, you know, again and again. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, John, what, what, how would you say your, your uh, internal voice tends to be? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very good at haranguing myself in, in sometimes not very nice ways, which is something I'm continually working on. Um, you know, we, we always use a lot of folks talk about having a positive mental attitude, this, that, the other thing. I think that, that, that the, the negative internal dialogue can sometimes be really um, um, damaging because 
a lot of I found what I say to myself in, in negative internal dialogue or is, is lies. I am not the worst trader in the world. I am, I am not the ugliest person in the world. I am not. So there's a, there, there's a book called positive intelligence. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but I read the book. It was given to me actually by Michael Patak and it says that all those internal voices are, they call them saboteurs and they, 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 they harangue you to to the level where they're lying to you, but you, if they harangue you enough, you start to believe it. And to talk back to them, basically, almost with like a mental hand um, uh, technique, mm -hmm. is okay. You know, the, the judge is telling me this. I know that it's not right, so I tell the judge, "You're wrong. That is not true about me." And that that every time you do that, that that nasty voice gets a little bit dimmer and a little bit dimmer. Yeah, there's good things that that we can give ourselves as far as, um, uh, you know, uh, criticisms uh, that are that are going to help us. And it's also, you know, the uh, like you said, the other side is if, if we think we're God's gift to trading. Well, every time I've done that, I've I've found that there's a lot of danger at the door. So I think it becomes a, a, a place of, of humility. You have to understand you're not perfect, but you can't let your internal dialogue beat you down. And you also, and when things are going well, you can't believe that it's going to go that way forever and you're God's gift to trading and you've got it now and you don't have to do any of the work anymore because you, things are going so well. It's coming back to that center, that humility to, to say, I don't know what's going to happen. I've got a strategy that I that I you know believe in and that is going to work. I have to trade that strategy, no matter what I'm being told inside my head, to be able to prove to me that it's right and that it will continue to 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 to, to profit over time. So, you know the I'm you know I I've been historically absolutely brutal in my internal dialogue, and I feel like I'm a better, happier person, which should make me a better trader when I talk back to those really negative things, constructive criticism internally, yes, very important. Mm -hmm. Right. And then, you know, again, you, you get up, you get ahead of yourself, you get full of yourself. And every time I've done that, I've just been whacked. Totally. Yeah. No, I, and I love the, the talking back to your internal dialogue in both sides. Mm -hmm. uh, the way that I would maybe have it evolve either for you or for others also is, when you kind of can understand the the inherent kind of lie, uh, then you can kind of figure out, and that's where the mental hand history comes in, what is truly flawed. Because if, if you have the thought, you know, you're the worst trader in the world, like what what is what is flawed about that idea? Number one, you have no way of knowing. Number two, even if you even if you did, you have a ton of evidence to support right in going to that judge to say i may be the worst trader in the world today let's let's just even say that that was hypothetically possible right uh, but here's all this evidence to show that i was not the worst trader in the world prior to today so is it possible is it plausible your honor that it's that i could go from being a successful trader that's clearly in the top one percent to going all the way to the very bottom of all traders in the world like that. Sometimes and, and it feels so like it. It, it, What it does is it kind of like, I think is like a ninja way around. Cause if you kind of battle head on with those negative thoughts mm -hmm. or even the positive ones too, you're going to have to keep doing that again and again and again, because they're just going to keep coming back. You're just going to keep time. having that fight. And sometimes that they're going to win because they're emotionally driven. Right. And so when you can kind of understand the underlying causality, the flaws that are really embedded in there, right? Here you are lying to yourself. It's straight fiction. Mm -hmm. so what's the base of that fiction? Well, there's a lot of people that have what's called black and white thinking. They think they're the worst or the greatest. They think that, you know, they're never going to make money. They can't see how they'll ever lose money. Right. And that black and white flaw is very, very common. That's what's happening in that moment. So, right, so, so by talking to yourself in the way I described, you're basically blowing that thing apart, right? That black and white now starts to have a bit, gray, a bit of gray to it, a bit more nuance to it. And that's how you evolve and have your thinking like automatically begin to change because 
you're not just changing what you're thinking, you're changing the nature by how your, your thoughts are even constructed. Love it. Love it. All right. Well, I think we're kind of short on time here. So uh, I, I, I think we are as well. But thank you, Jared, so much. We're going to cut this out and post the YouTube because we got so many requests in there. So always a pleasure. Awesome. Yeah. Well, good to, good to be here as always, guys. Well, until next time, wish, yeah, I, wish everybody well. So Jared, right right thank now. You. Thank you. You're, you're the master. <laughs> always appreciate you being here. And uh, thanks again. Thanks, Jared. Appreciate it. Right now, we're going to transition to a little uh, coffee break. Before we go to top quiz, I'll get my screen up as soon as possible so you can join. It's all about market profile today. If you get more than three or four right, three or four or up, you are randomly entered to win one of 50 50K combines because it is Bring Your Friend Week at Top Step. So get in there. Um, I have to switch right now this coffee break. Jared, thanks so much again. See you next time. See you guys.